Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Nate Clark from University of Michigan. Uh, Nate is finishing his PhD uh, at, in Ann Arbor. Uh, he's working with Professor Scott Malkey. And his thesis topic has been on uh, both compiler and architecture support for customized hardware accelerators. And he will be giving a talk on that today. Nate. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you all for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to start my talk today by making a, making a claim that I think will be obvious to many of you, but uh, it needs to be said. And that's that people want performance out of their computer systems. You know, a lot of people over the years have said, no, our computers are fast enough. We don't need any more performance. Let's focus on some other things. But I think history has shown over and over again that performance still matters. So you look at this quote and it seems absurd, right? Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples where performance matters. So let's say you, you wanted to find out uh, what's going on inside my head. Well, you can send me down to the hospital, put me in an fMRI machine, and you'll get a whole bunch of data out. Now, to make that data into a picture that you know, uh, a scientist can read and figure out what's going on in your brain, it takes incredible amounts of computational power. Only very recently have we been able to do this type of thing real time, and this is a, you know, a bit of a revolution in medicine because of that. Another area where the computation, uh, computational power that modern processors have provided us is you know, very apparent is in a modern video game. So the amount of computation needed to you know, create this scene is pretty staggering. The artificial intelligence involved with the, the, the agents uh, the physics interactions with the, with the world that you're moving around in, uh, not even to mention the vast amount of computation it takes to render all the graphics in this, uh, this scene is staggering. So, you know, over and over again, history has shown us that if you provide people with more computational power, they find something interesting to do with it. And even if you don't believe that, you know, these two applications are interesting to you, People find cool things to do when you give them more computational power. So now that I'm done making fun of uh, the place that I'm interviewing in, uh, <laughs> let's take a look at how we've gotten more computational power over the years on the desktop. So this chart shows the, the past few generations of Intel processors, uh, some of the microarchitectural techniques that were introduced on those uh, generations. Uh, and the bottom line here, is that the way we got more performance traditionally by is just ramping up the clock rate and adding the architectural support to make this possible. Deeper pipelines, more speculation, things like that. Yeah. Aren't those complementary techniques? No, they, you can't ramp up the clock rate without deepening the pipeline, without adding speculation support because the, the mispredictions okay. will kill you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we get more performance by ramping up the clock rate. And this was great. For you know, two decades, we were getting 50% performance improvement per year. Uh, but then something happened in 2002. Basically what happened is we hit the power wall. We can't ramp up the clock rate anymore because it's too expensive to, cheap the, to keep the chips from melting. And so ever since then, we've been going at this very slow 20% per year improvement in performance. Now this is a big problem because consumers got used to this 50%. So industry said, well, we still have Moore's Law in effect. We have lots more transistors. Uh, if we can't ramp up the clock rate, well, we'll just give you two cores, right? Twice the computational power, all our problems are solved. Well, there's all kinds of problems associated with this. The one I'm going to talk about is that these cores are not efficient enough to do some of the very uh, high computational requirement algorithms that are very compelling. So let me give you an example. Let's say you wanted to, to run 4G wireless. So 4G wireless is this next generation protocol which uh, is being pushed by cell phone manufacturers, uh, laptops, very high bandwidth wireless protocol. 
Now, if you wanted to run this on a multi-core, in order to do this real time and assuming perfect utilization of the resources, you're still going to need 50 Pentium M processors just because the processor design, the, the computational resources just do not match this algorithm well at all. So 50 processors, okay, you know, we're seeing the doubling of cores pretty rapidly. Uh, maybe that's feasible. But the, the real problem is that these 50 Pentium M's are going to be consuming over 2 kilowatts to run this thing real time. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want my laptop consuming 2 kilowatts on my lap. <laughs> yeah, or my cell phone. I'll have to buy some asbestos pants or something like that. So anyway, the, the point is that in order to do these, uh, you know, these algorithms, these compelling applications that require vast amounts of computational power, you really need customized hardware. So th this is a summary of the, the motivation here. Right? We have this demand for high performance still. We have transistors available. And we have this very low power envelope, this power wall, essentially. So there's a major push in the industry to improve the computational efficiency of uh, your hardware. And you can see this starting to happen more and more. So embedded systems have used hardware accelerators for years, but they're, they're moving up the stack. For example, uh, Sun's Niagara 2 processor had special purpose hardware to do encryption. And this was a big win for them because their, their general purpose core was really bad at doing the encryption algorithms. Uh, give you another example from industry. I ripped this graphic right out of AMD's technology roadmap. And what's going on is not really important. The, the point I'm trying to make is that you can see all these red boxes are special purpose hardware. They're accelerators to you know, make the computation more efficient. So accelerators are here. Accelerators are becoming more and more prevalent because we have this power wall and this demand for more computational power. So if accelerators are so important, let's look at how they're currently done in, in industry. Well, the basic way that accelerators work today is you have your, your baseline processor, and you strap an accelerator onto the side of this. This could be integrated into the pipeline. It could be off a bus. It doesn't really matter. Then you have some engineer, some compiler, go through your application, pick out the parts of the program that you want to run on the accelerator, and then you mark it in the binary in some way. So there's all kinds of great research problems here. Uh, looking at the hardware, so what, what, is, what does this accelerator look like? How do we design a piece of hardware that's uh, efficient, more efficient than the baseline processor? How do we make it you know, more useful across a, a wide range of applications? Things like that. Uh, the interface. Once we have this accelerator, how do we specify that we want to use that in the binary? So the, the interesting trade-off here is that you can put the control statically in the binary, but if you do that, then you're really tying your binary to one accelerator. So you want it to be general enough that it can be useful across a, a number of different accelerators, but because you know, not being general enough will really tie your binary to one one piece of hardware, and you have to re-engineer it. Uh, and then another set of problems is, how do we pick out the parts of this application that we want to run on the accelerator? I mean, this is a, a very tricky problem. Uh, most people know it in the context of SIMD accelerators. So how do you automatically SIMDize a program? You know, it's very difficult. And if you generalize the SIMD to you know, any accelerator, how do I use an ASIC automatically? Things like that. It's very tough problems. And my work has covered all these areas. Uh, I'm going to give you more of a, a breadth-first overview of what I've done. So if anybody wants more detail, raise your hand, shout, whatever. Uh, so we're going to start today by talking a little bit about the hardware itself. So how do you design a piece of hardware that's good for an application? So let's start about talking about accelerators in general. Uh, if you think about it, when you have your application, you compile it. Essentially what you get is a data flow graph, where the nodes are operations that you're performing on the data. And the edges represent the data that is flowing between the different operations. And this is what your computation looks like. 
So when you're designing an accelerator, essentially what you're doing is you're looking for subsets of the data flow graph that would be good to execute in hardware for whatever reason. So we're combining multiple of these primitive operations, these nodes in the data flow graph, and creating a piece of hardware out of that. So for example, we could see that you know, these colored patterns are recurring in our app program, so we create a special piece of hardware to run each of these data flow subgraphs. Now, when you create these new pieces of hardware, you have new instructions for them. And essentially, what you do is you compress these data flow subgraph regions to get the new data flow graph on the right here. So why is this more efficient than executing the standard ops by themselves? Well, there's three reasons. One, we're getting this vertical compression of the data flow graph. So many of these operations are very simple, you know, and, or, single gate delay. So there's a lot of slack in the clock cycle that we can, you know, combine these in hardware to do them at once, one cycle. So we're getting vertical compression of the data flow graph that way. Uh, the hardware naturally can support some par yeah. When you're talking about um, efficiency, are you talking about computation per time or computation per energy? They're related because you can obviously scale the clock and, you know, get the v-squared voltage scaling. Uh, I'm that's true. I guess what I was interested in the slack here, I thought that, you know, if, if you're, if the cost comes from toggling gates, mm -hmm. then you have to toggle as many gates here as you did otherwise. No, because you don't have to put them back in the registers. You don't have to put them back, well, three reasons. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're doing more in a clock cycle. Uh, you're doing horizontally, you're not using as many issue resources because this is compressed down to one thing at a time. And then the resource compression, which is what you're getting at, is each of these internal arcs, you're not reading and writing the register file. There's fewer overall nodes in the graph, which means you're using less reorder buffer entries, less iCache entries, uh, you know, all these things. So there's many reasons why this is more efficient than doing each of the nodes individually. So some of my early research was really focused on all right, given an arbitrary data flow graph, how do we pick out the recurring patterns that would be good to execute in hardware? I have a question on this. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you determine which parts of the big data flow graphs to uh, map into reconfigurable hardware? So let's say you have, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's the problem. This is a, a tricky problem, right? Because how do we? pick out the, these graphs that are repeating that are good for hardware and whatnot. So we sat down and we thought about this for a while. And the, the obvious solution, we always try that first, right? So let's just look at every possible subgraph. Obviously, there's an exponential number of these. But it turns out that if you're only considering these uh, graphs on a super block basis, that using the try every possible combination of nodes algorithm actually works for the vast majority of cases. We were kind of surprised to learn that. But obviously, you get into situations like this where it completely falls apart. So this is a, a really hideous data flow graph from one application that we were looking at. And this is actually only one quarter of it. So trying one, you know, trying every possible combination of operations in this graph is computationally infeasible. So what we did is we developed an algorithm which it puts weights on each of these edges based on how good it would be to combine the two nodes on this edge. So the, the thinking here is that you want to partition this graph up so that we can do this uh, you know, try everything algorithm within the partitions. So we were trying to separate the graph based on edges that wouldn't make good custom hardware. So what does that mean? Well, currently we're focused on just computation. So we cut edges at memory boundaries. We cut edges at control flow boundaries. Uh, you know, certain hardware operations are not necessarily good to speed up as an accelerator. For example, divide. You know, uh, a divider in hardware is a very heavy weight operation. So in order to justify the diarrhea cost of including that operation in an accelerator, it would have to provide quite a bit of benefit. So we weight the edges around divides to be less important. So after we 
do this weighting, we run it through a, a part, graph partitioner and then enumerate within each of the partitions. And this gives us a, a set of subgraphs that we think might be good as accelerators. So this is really a design automation technique. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we have these partitioners, or these, all these graphs enumerated within uh, in the data flow graph as a whole, we group them based on identical patterns, and we use profiling to determine you know, how much improvement are we going to get by implementing this data flow subgraph in hardware, and how much is this going to cost us in terms of hardware. Yeah? You say how much improvement? You mean over a run of the program? I mean, are, is, is, is the reason these numbers vary so much is that you're weighting them according to how many loops? These numbers vary because they're made up. Uh, in general, yeah, we use application profiling to get, uh, to get a feel for is this in the hot loop or is this in a piece of code that I don't care about. Okay. But that, that's, where, that's why you would see numbers that are different. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, exactly. I, I understand you made the numbers up. They're supposed to represent some concept. I'm trying to capture that concept. So that what you're saying is that purple blob on the upper left, um, that gain of 10,000 cycles might mean you, you gained a little bit less than the one on the right. It's just that you ran it a lot more. Exactly, exactly. Or perhaps the, uh, the graph on the left could have compressed a lot more resources. So it wasn't necessarily run more. It was better for other reasons. Perhaps it was on the critical path, right? Exactly. Exactly. So maybe you'll talk about this. But you, you said you uh, stop uh, adding nodes to this. Or, or you, you stop at control flow boundaries. Yes. Right? How much of a limitation does that add in terms of the size of the subgraphs you can form? Uh, that's a good question. So there, I didn't do this study. Uh, some other researchers did a study you know, ignoring control flow boundaries. How much better can we do? And it's not significant. The intuition behind that is if you think about it, you're going to get the most bang for your buck in these loops that you spend 90% of your time in. We can capture that loop body just fine. And we can do loop unrolling to make the computation bigger, more exposed, things like that. Uh, so we do, do, we do get around control flow boundaries to a certain extent. Uh, we're also doing hyperblock formation. So the if-then-else, we're, we're capturing that. So the control flow boundaries that we have are? So your baseline is hyperblocks. Yes. That means some of the control flow is already uh, converted into exactly. data flow. So. so the question is, how much of that extra control flow, how much of that is important? And my intuition is the answer is no, and other researchers have concluded that as well. So we're pretty comfortable with that. Yeah? I'm trying to, to use the past to predict the future. Would this me method have managed to find the, the, the real winning accelerator up to today, which is a hardware floating point unit? <laughs> so it depends on. Okay, let me back up. So we're, we're looking at acyclic computation. If I'm calling into this floating point library a lot, I, this algorithm is going to realize that this is the important bit of computation. Uh, is all the control flow in the floating point unit you know, going to be captured by my algorithm, or am I going to throw it away because of that? And my intuition is that that's what would be the case, that I would not rediscover the floating point unit. But we are rediscovering many things that you would consider uh, useful. For example, when I run the algorithm on uh, JPEG image processing, we rediscover saturating arithmetic. Uh, we rediscover, uh, what else did we rediscover? There's a number of things that uh, multiply, accumulate, we rediscover quite frequently, dot product, things like that. So we are rediscovering things that people already knew about. But we're also discovering things, a lot of things that Oh, you'd have to be crazy to come up with. <laughs> so, yeah, the results are, are interesting and not necessarily intuitive. Will you show us a breakdown of uh, how, much, uh, how much your discovery, apart from what people already do, gains? Like, r rather than multiply and add, for example. The delta above. Yeah, the delta above, above that. That's uh, Because... Uh, that would be the really interesting part, I think, right? That's well, let me, let, let me go yeah, maybe I'm one slide ahead. ahead. Yeah, Tell me if I answer your question. Sure, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we, 
heuristically gauge you know, how good, how much this is going to cost us, and then use a pretty standard dynamic programming algorithm to select the actual new instructions we want to add. So this is a, a design automation algorithm. And we actually got the chance to implement this in industry. So ARM has a product called Optimode, which enables you to really rapidly develop RTL for uh, a processor which, a VLIW style processor, which uh, is targeted for a specific application or a set of applications. So you can dev uh, parameterize the VLIW, you'll automatically have a compiler that works for this, and enables you to rapidly uh, develop this. Uh, and I had the chance to go to Belgium and uh, implement this instruction selection algorithm in the product. And so <clears throat> uh, what we did was we developed a, a very standard VLIW that was, seemed pretty good at executing a number of encryption algorithms, which is on the baseline here. Yeah, they got 1.0 on all of them. Exactly. <laughs> so we have this processor. Uh, actually, I have another slide which we compare the, the, the VLIW to a, a standard ARM processor, but it's not fair to make that the relative. But anyway, off on a tangent. Uh, right, so we developed this processor that's pretty good at doing a uh, regular encryption algorithm. Yeah? I remember. I'm shocked that 3DES isn't the winner in this because this is a bitch to do in software. Everything is the wrong number of bits. You know, it, six bits coming in, four bits coming out, shuffle the bits. It looks easy in, in hardware and, and a bitch in software and, you, and, you, and it doesn't even speed up as much as MD5. MD5 looks a lot like that, dude. No. Um, okay, my Not as bad as this. Okay. Well, I, I guess what you're getting at here is... Uh, one of the limitations in our thing, and is that's that we're, we're taking what the software gives us and we're not modifying the algorithm, right? A human can do these tweaks to recover the larger blocks of computation that maybe we can't see because... You're taking the code written in C. C. You just bytes and, and, and word, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. Now I understand. So, yeah, this... Obviously, the speed up when we add these, a couple of custom instructions, is pretty significant, you know, 2x... In the common case, uh, but like like you mentioned, where a human can do better, this is a design automation algorithm. It got implemented. We're pretty happy. If you have a couple million dollars in your pocket, want to go buy a copy of Optimode, you can use this piece of research. Uh, and yeah, this is a powerful tool. We can automatically find the most important parts of computation in a given benchmark. So the next step, we're thinking, okay, we can find, p automatically pick out the important computation in a benchmark. So this works really well f if you want to design an application-specific processor. But can we use this to evaluate how, what the typical computation looks like in a, in a general purpose style? So how do we design a piece of hardware that's really good at doing the common computations from a wide range of applications? So that's what we did. We you know, took a look at standard pipeline, and we're trying to design a, a special function unit or you know, piece of hardware that's good at doing a wide range of computations. So essentially what we did, we took 50 applications, basically whatever we had lying around, we picked out all the important uh, computations from each of them, and we did this union. And we were trying to design this, you know, the set of function units in an array style that would be really good at executing the general case. So we're trying to get this, all these different resource, vertical, horizontal resource compressions in a general purpose manner. And we did some design space exploration, and this is essentially what we came up with. Uh, looking at a typical application, you know, the, the major types of computation uh, typically has, you need four inputs, two outputs, uh, and then this large number of ALUs. So each of these rows has a, a unique type of function unit where we're doing some arithmetic, add, subtract, compare, uh, some bitwise logic operations in the green. And then we have some interconnect connecting all these function units up. And we found that this piece of hardware supported 82% of the important subgraphs, the important parts of computation from a wide variety of applications. Now obviously there's trade-offs to be made here. Uh, we arrived at this design because at 3.2 nanoseconds, it fit within the clock cycle of uh, one of ARM's embedded processors who we're working with real closely 
uh, in developing this. Uh, so this is what your computation looks like in general. The, the interesting thing here is rethinking instruction set design. So why do we have a not instruction in our RISC ISA? You know, it's, you're pulling it out of the big iCache, you're reading from a giant register file, you're sending it through two transistors, and then back into the register file. This is what your computation looks like. So, that pretty much, uh, yeah. How do you back up the slide? So the, the idea is you, you drop this reconfigurable unit into your execution stage, and then the software can set some bits to configure how, this, how the, the interconnects can connect these units? Reconfigurable is sort of a loaded word. When people say reconfigurable, they mean, typically mean FPGA, where you're loading a lookup table and things like that. This is not reconfigurable in the sense that all you're doing is setting MUX values. So it's as reconfigurable as your standard ALU. Uh, but how, that, how do the control bits for that, those MUXs get into the binary? That's, is that the question? Well, okay, so I mean, I guess, I mean, it's the idea that you have some, you have an instruction in the binary somewhere that says load, uh, that, that, that loads a special processor control register that sets all these MUX bits? I'm going to get into that a little bit more later. Uh, you can think of it as, this takes about, uh, I, want to, I believe it was on the order of 200 bits to configure. So this is not a, a ridiculous amount of extra bits. So, and there's how many boxes there? And we'll play that up. Uh, 15. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, eight, 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 I guess 15 bits per, per box or something like that. Mm -hmm. and so the, each blue box actually has a, a collection of functions that you can choose from? Yes. If you do the math, it's, it's on the order of 200 bits to configure. And, and a logic box, is, it means moving... Uh... It means just bitwise operations. So if you put ads in each of these levels, the, that's the critical path. So it gets much slower. So we, we restrict the functionality in the middle in order to you know, the keep the latency so short, but at the same time support as many of these as we possibly can. Okay. okay. So the idea is to have a bunch of these CCAs in the processor and configure them differently for different subgraphs? Yeah, the idea is to, this is what your computation looks like. So this can support a wide range of typical computations. Oh, okay. You, have, so, you, you will talk about the architecture that uh, uses these CCA designs, like uh, how you instantiate these CCAs, how many of those do you need, or, or uh, can you support multiple subgraphs in one CCA, for example? So we can support disconnected subgraphs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the architectural issues. Uh, although they have been covered. So this, not in this exact form, but it has been prototyped in ARM, and this is probably going to appear in your cell phone in a couple of years. For comparison, how big is an ARM in this technology? Uh, the ARM is 5 millimeters squared, I believe, with cache. Uh, this is a, a pretty simple ARM, though. Uh, the more recent ones are closer to eight. Including cache. Including cache. Thanks. So, yeah, essentially we're using that design automation algorithm to rethink the execution stage. Uh, again, this is how we envision it sort of sitting into the pipeline. I don't know if this is a... So, I guess, is there only one, or do you need more? You can use more. Uh, we, all, we have typically evaluated with one. Mm -hmm. But uh, but if you have one, then you choose the most common subgraph to support. Or no, no, no. it's dynamically recon dynamically configurable. So think of it as an ALU, right? It can do an add, it can do a subtract, it can do uh, so binary you, operations. So each of these is. Is the idea that you, 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 you have some 200-bit registers, and then on the fly you say, I want the fourth, reg fourth, fourth register, and then the 13th register, and then the... I mean, is that what you mean by on the fly? Like, on this cycle, I can use this to do one operation, on the next yes. cycle, I can use it to do another. Yes. And so I preload the set of operations I want into a table somewhere. You don't preload it any more than you would preload a, a function unit, right? There's control bits that are decoded, and create. you create this control register, and that is what tells the FU what to do. Right? Now our FU is just a lot bigger. It has a lot more control associated with it. Do, do, those, do those control bits live in the instruction string? Like, do I have to... Yes. I have to decode them every time I want to do this thing? Yes. Okay. 
So the, the trade-off is how much you save uh, by removing individual instructions versus how much you add just uh, these control bits into the instruction exactly. stream. Exactly. And uh, how much, uh, like, do you increase the instruction stream or do you? It seems like adding a lot of that direction would solve that sort of problem, right? Because you, could just, you only need, it sounds, seems like you only need. Actually, let's put this on the shelf because the next section of my talk is indirection. How do we do that? Great point, though. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to add giant instructions anyway. So just to do, give you a quick idea of the power performance efficiency of uh, you know, adding this, piece of, this big piece of hardware, which is good at doing the typical computation, uh, I ported the Trimarine compiler to the ARM instruction set and added the ability to pick out these subgraphs. And then we modeled it assuming uh, an ARM 926. So the ARM 926 is a, a pretty popular embedded core. It's in the Nintendo DS. It's in the iPhone. Uh, single issue, in order five stage, pretty, pretty standard embedded processor. Uh, and we're comparing the ARM 926 without an accelerator to one with this CCA that we designed. So x-axis here, we have a, a number of benchmarks. Uh, y-axis, as I mentioned, the speed up over an ARM 926 without acceleration. And what I'm comparing to is uh, the light blue bar here is out of order two issue processor, ARM, ARM 926, uh, out of order four issue ARM 926. And then the green bar is ARM 926 still in order, but with this piece of hardware you know, targeted to do the common computation. So what we see is applications like MCF where it's memory bound, you know, doing the computation really well is a waste of your time, obviously. Uh, and Bell's Law here, right? But in a number of cases, by providing this piece of hardware, which is really good at doing the common computation patterns, you're getting huge wins, you know, much higher than out of order four issue even. So this is because, again, we're getting the, the vertical compression, we're getting horizontal compression, and we're getting resource compression. Uh, and in the average case, we're seeing, you know, we're doing better than out-of-order two-issue processing. Uh, so this is very interesting, you know. We're doing the computation better and for less complexity than your typical out-of-order processing. Yeah. yeah, I guess that, that, that less complexity is an interesting question, right? I mean, pre presumably the, the budget here is transistors and or power. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to get a, you know, uh, is, is it... Is it either or? Can you do two issue or your CCA thing? Or your oh, no, you can do both. They're, in some sense, they're orthogonal because out of order. Uh, I mean, out of order is, is, the, is the rest of the pipeline and you're just the execution stage. So it seems like these are totally orthogonal. They are. They're definitely orthogonal. Okay. Uh, I just. So, so does that mean the only budget consideration is transistors? There's complexity as well. Uh, transistors kind of equates to power because static is becoming the dominant factor in the power equation. Uh, I mean, all these things have to be taken into account when, you know, doing a design. Uh, so, so does that mean that the way to compare these two, when you, when you say we're kind of competitive with two issue, um, is the way to compare these speed up per, you know, f for the amount of transistor budget you're spending and, and how much more, how many more transistors are, who, who's spending more and by how much? I don't know the answer is how many transistors it costed to issue. Complexity is another factor that you have to work in because verifying uh, you know, a piece of combinational logic is a lot simpler than verifying you know, all the interplay between the instructions and uh, issue logic, things like that. Uh, so that's the development time cost. I'm not saying this is a great comparison. I, I, I'm just trying to put it in perspective on the order of the, the magnitude that we're providing. I think the reason I'm trying to get at, get at this is you're, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. Yes, right? I a totally different technique to another technique. Yes. For blues and greens, I guess. Um, so I would, I was, I'm trying to find a way to relate the apple to the orange so that I can make this comparison. In, in some respects, I mean, speed up is all you care about. So it's not entirely apples and oranges. Uh, combining the techniques would do better. That's, I think, what your problem is with the comparison. Yeah. Uh, I presume that th these are the applications you, 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 you tu tune your, your, uh, your supercompiler on. What happens when you add new applications? Because there's been too much, ever since Drystone, there's been this cheating of one benchmark <laughs> and then the uh, real code breaks down badly. So have you been guilty of that? That's a great question. Uh, we've actually done uh, a lot of experiments on you know, how sensitive we are, are we to, you know, new benchmarks and things of that nature. 
Uh, so what, one, one, a couple experiments we did was we took a, a number of related benchmarks, say image processing uh, or sound processing, uh, encryption related. We would you know, take, say if we had 14 benchmarks, we'd take about 10 of them, design something targeted for those 10, and then see how it did on the other four. And what we find is that it's pretty good. If you have a, a large enough sample set, you know, extrapolating out further is, you know, it works fine. All right, so I'm running way behind uh, on time here, so I'm going to try and speed things up a bit. Uh, the summary of this architecture, you know, specifically targeted for applications is, this is what your computation looks like. Uh, your computation doesn't look like what the risk instruction set to provides. So when you, you know, identify these things, you can instantiate hardware specifically for that, and you get big wins. It's more efficient at the end of the day. And both of these uh, techniques have been prototyped in industry, so I'm not just making crap up. Uh, all right, so I talked about how do we do, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have, uh, will you show us any subgraphs? What, what do they look like? Uh, I, I think this ties back to my previous question on, yeah, like, yeah, are you dis right. discovering the um, uh, multiply and accumulates? And how much benefit you're getting from that versus how much benefit you're getting from more, much more complex subgraphs that the ISA designers have not thought about, for example? Uh, so I have a backup slide on some of the subgraphs I've discovered, but uh, can I talk to you later about Sure, that? yeah, we can. Cool. All right, so I talked about the hardware design. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the interface here, which is getting back to, to your question about, you know, do I just put 200 bits in my binary? That, screws things up in the decode, all that stuff like that. So, you know, a major problem with accelerators and software nowadays is the control is statically placed in the binary. So, what this means is, you know, if I have just one accelerator, this application will work just fine. But if I want to run that binary on a uh, processor that doesn't have an accelerator, I can't do it. Likewise, if the accelerator evolves in a way that's not binary compatible, your binary, again, has to be completely re-engineered, and this is a, a major problem. Uh, the other problem, like you mentioned before, is that even going s straight to this accelerator is you have decode complexity to worry about. So what we're trying to do here is, can we abstract away the accelerator features and dynamically create this control so that the binary can work on any system. And this is exactly what I just talked about here. So this red line represents the static dynamic interface. And what we want to do is pick out the part of the computation that you want to run on an accelerator, but describe it in a way such that we can easily dynamically compile that binary to whatever acceleration we have available in the system. So if you don't have it, that's fine. We can still run the binary. Uh, if you know, your accelerator evolves, we can still run the binary. Everything's great. Now, what we have to do in order to make this feasible is examine the compiler algorithms necessary to do that binding because you don't want the compilation to take so long as to outweigh the benefits provided by the accelerator in the first place. Uh, and the key here is developing the right static dynamic interface so that you're doing all the hard stuff offline. Now let me give you an example again, going back to the SIMD. Uh, so it's very hard to take a program that does nothing, or does nothing offline and dynamically discover all the SIMD that you want to run. Because you have to do uh, memory dependence analysis online, things like that. And you just can't do it. Uh, so what we want to do is do the hard stuff offline. So we want to identify the parts that you want to run in SIMD and then recompile it online to target, say, the, the correct width of your SIMD accelerator or something of that nature. Does that make sense? Blank steps. Okay. <laughs> the, the basic trade-off here is you want to pick out what parts of the computation you want to accelerate it, and then be able to retarget based on the accelerator you have. Uh, and the way we propose to do this is by just identifying which parts you want to, to accelerate. So we identify these subgraphs, and then we pull them out as special function calls. 
So these subgraphs are still represented using the baseline instruction set of the processor. So you're immediately backwards compatible. You can run this application on a system that doesn't have an accelerator and it works fine. But now if you add an accelerator, all you need is a, a runtime translator to convert this back into the, the 200 bits needed to configure your thing. And now your binary works for that accelerator. Likewise, whenever you change the accelerator, as long as you update the translation, then your binary still works. You can still take advantage of whatever hardware you have available. So let me give you a, a, a quick idea of how this works. Uh, so we have a, a pipeline here. Now we're executing this binary that has this subgraph pulled out. So the first time it's executing, go through fetch, standard pipeline, uh, and then it'll retire. Now after retirement, you have some dynamic compilation engine which can recognize that, hey, this isn't actually a function call. This is a piece of code that I want to run on an accelerator. Did you put an instruction in the stream to say, hey, that stuff we just did should be looked at, or did you recognize that dynamically? I recognize that dynamically. So every function call, I start looking at it and say, oh, is this match? Okay, so the, the unit is, is function call boundaries. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it, these, the size of something that can fit in your CCA mm -hmm. is not necessarily an entire function call, right? It's a piece in the middle of a function. Yes. A block or, or a subblock. Yes. So uh, how, are you, how, are you, how are you identifying the opportunities for dynamic compilation here if you're not labeling them in the binary? We're labeling them in the binary as a function call. Okay, so, so when you find that spot. So this function call is completely introduced by us. It's not a real function call. It's, it's, a, it's a compiler trick. Yeah, I, I understand. You're, you're, you're introducing a function there to, to, to mark the boundary. That, that is the label. Exactly. exactly. But is it, is it different from any other function call? It's, is this? it's different in the respect that it doesn't conform to the API. Okay. It, uh, it's, it's just like procedural abstraction. Are you familiar with that technique? They use it for code size reduction where you pick out patterns that uh, exist in the, in the code repeatedly and you just pull those out as a function call. So you don't have to you know, register allocate specially. It already takes that into account. So there's no spilling, no restoring. Uh, but it, the hardware can execute it as if it was a function call. And it's completely ignorant to the fact that this could be, you know, the baseline pipeline is ignorant to the fact that. When you say it doesn't conform to the API. You mean it, 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 it doesn't conform to the API. But it, 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 yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. API. You can't link to it, for example. Yes. It's, it's just, it, but, it, but it's an ISA level function. Yes. But in terms of the instruction itself, the, uh, it is the same as a call instruction. Yes. That's no different from any other calls, right? Correct. So how do you uh, figure out what to dynamically compile? What's the dynamic compiler? Basically, you have a function call that uh, that is something random that that cannot be accelerated. Yes, yes. Versus so you have something you have this function. That's a great that question. Can be accelerated. Uh, you, you try it no matter what. Yeah. In the exactly. case, uh, yeah. In the case, in the most common case, you try it no matter what, and the ABI will be such that it can't translate that. Uh, for the CCA. It doesn't even matter if, you, if it wasn't meant to be, if it can map that because there's no accepting instructions, uh, because there's no assumptions about memory analysis. It'll execute that subgraph and it'll be correct. So you, it doesn't matter. Uh, in other cases, if you do have some assumptions made statically about the function of the underlying accelerator, then yeah, you need some unique way to modify that, uh, to mark that call as being special. But uh, that's not typically the case, so we sort of punt on the issue. Uh, okay, so subroutine runs through the pipeline, you dynamically translate it, then you store these 200 bits uh, to configure your CCA or whatever accelerator you have in a, in a microcode cache. And then what we do is we mark that this branch, this function call branch, uh, is not actually a function call, it's accelerated code. And so the next time when you fetch that branch, your pipeline can say, oh, no, this isn't actually a branch. Don't follow that. Get the control bits out of the, the microcode cache and then use the accelerator. So in this way, we're able to you know, have one binary but use it on any system. And the translator, the dynamic compiler, whatever you want to call it, is able to retarget that binary. And you 
also neatly solved the instruction stream issue because now you don't bother ever looking at those instructions again. You just get the bits, the configuration bits out of the, the cache, and then you jump immediately to the end of the. Like the, the next program counter is is, is where the end of that. Uh, exactly. So you you maintain good iCache behavior because of that. Uh, so I skipped a slide in there. Uh, so again, we actually implemented this. We have a, a test chip, uh, and, and we use that to estimate some, you know, some of the possible problems with this virtualization strategy. Uh, one, uh, first problem that we looked at was code bloat. Obviously, we're adding all these branch instructions. That could be a problem. Uh, in the worst case, we found it was still less than 1%. So this was not a big deal. Uh, the cost of the dynamic compiler. So you could implement this dynamic compiler in software. You could do it in hardware. I don't really care. Uh, you can do it either way, and it'll be fine. Just to demonstrate that it can be done, we did it in hardware, and we found that it was very small. It was you know, 0.2 millimeters squared plus a 2K cache. But with this cost, you're getting you know, binary compatibility across different uh, generations of a processor, which is very good. Uh, the last thing we wanted to look at is the, the, comp the performance overhead from the dynamic compiler. And we saw that in the worst case, performance was impact less than 0.1%. So we're getting this flexibility for very little cost. You know, very little code overhead, very little hardware cost, very little performance overhead. Oh, OK. This is over having the CCA and having doing, a sta doing all, everything statically. This is over. Like you, you're, you're, you're saying that okay, these are different comparisons. You're trying to, you're trying to the, the third bullet is measuring the cost of having a vir, a virtual interface to this rather than an explicit interface. Exactly, exactly. So we we implemented this for the CCA. We also did it for SIMD style acceleration. Uh, you know, this is not this is easy. It's an easy technique to do, and it works very well. So we talked about accelerator design, actually. How am I doing on time? I'm pretty far. Just 35 minutes. Oh, OK. <laughs> What's that? I'll be that with you later. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> well, we had a lot of questions. Sorry. That's two. Yeah, that's good. OK, I'm going to, I guess, go through the compiler section really quick. So the, the basic idea here is how do we automatically pick out parts of the code to be accelerated? Uh, and just talking a little bit about compiler problems in general, they're all NP-hard. If they weren't, they wouldn't be interesting. So uh, because of this, people tend to say, oh, this is NP-hard. I'm just going to use a greedy algorithm. It's fast. It's easy to implement. But the problem is if you look at the design space of algorithms, if I have runtime on the x-axis and you know, the quality of the result on the y-axis, if you fully explore the design space, it takes forever because it's an exponential problem. And you know the greedy algorithm is really fast, but the quality is pretty, pretty poor. So what my compiler work is really doing is trying to find something in this knee area. So we want good quality, but we need fast runtime as well. Uh, so again, we're trying to, my compiler work is looking at how do we pick out pieces of the code to run on you know, this, the CCA here. Uh, if you look at industry, again, they use a lot of hand coding or greedy algorithms if they have any compiler support. So it's really a, a wide open space. Uh, let me give you a, a common greedy technique. It's basically, uh, let me back up a second. So this is a data flow graph from G721 in code, which is an embedded benchmark we were looking at. Now, co common greedy compiler technique to pick out a subgraph to run on the accelerator is you know, to start with some node. And then just keep growing it until you can't along the data flow edges. So our accelerator can support subgraphs that are four high, so we grow to that point, and then we stop. And then you start growing back up the data flow edges, and then until you can't grow any further because of some boundary of the block or you know, some architectural boundary for whatever reason. And then you just sort of repeat this pattern until you, you grow as much as you possibly can. Now, if I assume that each of these nodes takes one cycle and each of these green blobs becomes one cycle on the accelerator, my speed up here is 17 over 7 because you have 17 nodes before and then after all this compression you have 7. It's 2.4. Uh, 
So what we developed was a, a three-step algorithm which does a much better job at you know, identifying the parts of, applica of an application that you want to run on an accelerator. Where first we enumerate all the subgraphs again. Uh, and then we use isomorphism to determine whether or not a, an accelerator can run on a given piece of, sorry, let me back up, to figure out if a data flow subgraph can be run on a given piece of hardware. And then finally we use uh, unit covering formulation to do the, the last step of actually picking which ones to run on the, on the uh, accelerator. So all these steps are either exponential or NP-hard. So how are you doing this? Well, the, the key is that we use some domain-specific tricks to, to speed up the search to, so we can solve these problems in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so the, the premise you're getting at at a high level here is that greedy only has one option. Here, you're admitting multiple options, but you're not going to search the entire space. So you're We're going to search a lot more of it, yeah, yeah. but not all of it, yes. exactly. So you can, you can make your way up to the end. Okay. Exactly. So yeah, oh, we designed a lot of uh, tricks to make sure that we were getting rid of huge parts of the design space without hopefully getting rid of the important parts. That's the, those, that's the idea here. Uh, so actually I'm not going to talk too much about the tricks that we did play because it kind of requires quite a bit of uh, you know, low level understanding of the particular algorithms. But just to give you a quick example of you know, the high level idea of how we're exploring this design space more fully. We're enumerating every subgraph within this block. So we're not just greedingly growing to find, you know, certain subgraphs. We're getting all kinds of crazy shapes, disconnected graphs, things like that. Uh, the next step is proving that this subgraph, once we find it, can actually run on, an, uh, on a piece of hardware. So what we do is we construct a graph representing an accelerator. So it might look something like this, which is pretty, uh, you know, made, contrived example. But essentially what we're trying to do is map each of these operations onto the hardware so that we know that the control can be created uh, and so on. I'm going to skip through this because uh, not terribly interesting. And again, time restrictions. And then finally, we perform unit covering to pick out which subgraphs that we actually want accelerated. So uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with unit covering. The, the way it works is we construct a matrix where each operation in the, the basic block is a, is a row. And the columns are the different subgraphs that we've enumerated that we know can be run on this accelerator. So what we're trying to do is pick out a set of columns such that every operation is covered. Essentially, we're trying to minimize the number of subgraphs needed to do the computation in the, in the application. And again, unit covering is a well-known problem. Uh, there's some tricks that we played to, to make it faster for our particular domain of, uh, of problem. Uh, and essentially, what you end up with is a solution that looks like this. So you can see that we're covering uh, a much more of the, the data flow graph with fewer green blobs. And our speed up is 3.4 compared to the greedy solution, which only gives you, you know, 2.4 for this example. Uh, so here's uh, some quick evaluation numbers. Here. Uh, the benchmarks, again, on the x-axis, speed up over a processor without an accelerator on the y-axis. The light blue bar is the greedy technique, and the, the dark blue bar is this more exhaustive technique that I developed. So you can see, on average, we're doing 10% better. Uh, a lot of people say 10%, who cares? Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll remind you of Probstein's law, which is that the compiler doubles the performance every 18 years. So 10% in the compiler community is a, a big win. Uh, you'll note in some applications that have really large basic blocks, we're doing a, a lot, lot better than greedy. And that's because the design space is so big that greedy algorithms tend to get stuck in a local minimum. Whereas we're doing a much better job exploring this, and so we can do much better. You know, applications where the, the critical loop is just a few operations, the greedy solution can come up with the, op, the optimal solution just as fast as we can, so there's not really much benefit. So if you have the time to run this more exhaustive algorithm, you know, you're going to do a lot better. So the question is, how much 
time does it actually take to run this? Yeah, back up the slide. For, so for, for this, you really only had one choice here, but you had to tell this thing when, you had to, get, you had to have some heuristics for when to stop looking in your, in your space. Is that a knob you can turn, and how did you turn that knob here? We actually developed an algorithm that is knob-free. It, it, we, we statically decide what, what things get pruned, and it just seems to work well across everything that we've so, tried. So basically you're saying that the, the dark blue bar is my collection of choices, and now we're going to go look at how, how expensive those are. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, the difference between the two seems dominated by a few outliers. What happens if you plot the median rather than the mean? So the, the, the big jump in SHA doesn't uh, dominate. Uh, I don't understand the question. So, well, you, you, at the right hand, you plotted arithmetic means. Yes. So dominated by outliers. Well, Correct. How would it look if you plotted medians? So the median of the median of all of all the others of all the real benchmarks looks to me it would not be as dramatic as the arithmetic mean because there are a few big big ones and a lot of rather mediocre ones. I agree with you, uh, but again, we're still doing on average. On median, uh, <laughs> I, I'd say we're definitely getting you know the five to ten percent pretty regularly. And again, in the compiler community, this is good. Yeah. So. Okay. So again, this is an obvious win if you if the runtime is not so exorbitant that this is a problem. So what this graph shows is the x-axis is the size of a block in the number of operations. The, the y-axis is the runtime in seconds. So for each block and all the applications we looked at, how long did it take to run our algorithm on it? Uh, I graphed n and n squared as a, a point of comparison. So what we found is that over 98% of the blocks, we could run our more exhaustive algorithm in under a second. And if we increase that budget to 99 and a half, uh, I'm sorry, to 10 seconds, you can do the you know, vast majority of the blocks in these applications. So this algorithm is fast enough. And even with the, the couple of outliers here, the average application runtime was 45 seconds. So this is not, or compile time, sorry. This is not a, a huge overhead here. So two questions. One is the idea with that red line is you could just set a budget and say, well, I'll just stop after. I'll take the best the of the blocks or the high ones. Yeah, so the, yeah. the answer question is on that previous um, slide, you know, you, you, you made the argument that we win when there are really big blocks. So I'm wondering where that uh, SHA dot is on this graph. That's a great point. So I, I did that experiment. I was like, okay, you know, as you mentioned, if we made the 10-second cutoff and this happened to be the really important dot, then we're hosed. Well, I, I artificially set a limit at 20 seconds, and it turns out that that important dot isn't up there. This dot happened to be unimportant. Okay. I don't know. It's not. It's not a very. It doesn't leave you with a good feeling. And, yeah, and, I understand. But an interesting graph, I guess, would be uh, to some way, to, to somehow plot these dots. Or, you know, time, compile time versus quality. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah I, I agree with you. We. I, I did by hand some experiments of you know adjusting the the cutoff time limit uh, and seeing how that hurt us, and I took it down to like I said, 20 seconds per block, and I was still getting the same numbers, so I considered that. It's not the graph that you want to see, but... But, but it, was a, it was a black box sensitive analysis. Yes. Okay. Do, you, do you have a similar graph on larger applications? Like, how does it scale? Larger applications. Uh, so... In terms of, the, like, more commercial size applications? So commercial applications, like, in my experience... Or maybe even spec... Uh, Spec is not a problem because the basic blocks are so small, or the hyper blocks are so small typically, that you know they're down in the noise here. I've run this on spec. Uh, you know the the slide I showed you comparing the two issue, four issue. That was you know using this algorithm, and it's specs in the noise. That's not interesting. All these points up here that are interesting, they're they tend to be encryption. Uh, media processing type things that do really big pieces of computation. Like so. Some of the floating point applications may have similar behavior, uh, floating right? Floating point I haven't looked at. So okay. that, that would be actually an interesting Yeah, especially if you do a little bit of rolling and 
Right, right. If you abort your computation after 20 seconds, do you have an answer and just not, not the best one you could have found, or do you basically have you wasted that 20 seconds? I use the greedy, I use the greedy solution first as a bound to help uh, cut off bad parts of the search tree. So yeah, I have at no worse the greedy solution. All right, so I talked today a little bit about each of these three different aspects in uh, customizing hardware, hardware accelerators. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about where I think this space is going and uh, what I'd like to work on in this space. Uh, there's kind of three aspects here. There's you know, what the hardware looks like, and then this hybrid static dynamic compilation system that I think is really going to be key in the future. Uh, so I think going forward, looking at the trends, what the desktop hardware is going to look like is something that one of my committee members likes to call Frankenchip, <laughs> where uh, you, know, you have a, a standard multiprocessor, and then you strap on some customized hardware accelerators. These are not the ones you were just talking about because they're a lot farther from the processor. Right? Exactly. So when you, what I talked about previously is you know, very small pieces of computation. And I look at that as a building block. Uh, and when you put these much farther away from the computation, or from the processor, you obviously need to do larger and larger pieces of, of work. And so these are going to be more like a graphics card. And AMD's already you know, announced their fusion architecture where the graphics card is going to be on chip. I think more and more things are going to be on chip in the future. Uh, the encryption processor I talked about from Niagara, things like that. So I think there's a lot of really great research questions here. So what other killer applications do we want to imp integrate you know, new architectures for? Uh, how do we design something that's very efficient for these applications? You know, how do we even measure how efficient it is, how programmable it is? These are some great areas to work on, I think. Uh, moving up the stack, this idea of one binary for any system. So whenever the underlying architecture changes, it's really expensive to re-engineer this application. So we need to look at how do we define the abstraction of the accelerator such that we can evolve the hardware without having to change the binary. And the key here is examining the compiler algorithms needed to do this last step mapping in your abstraction. You know, this is really going to define what kind of abstraction we can have. The example I like to use to describe this is the graphics card. It's the one successful accelerator in uh, desktop machines today. And when you write code to use a graphics card, use DirectX, OpenGL, something like that, and there's a dynamic compiler in the driver which takes care of this last step mapping for you. Uh, you know, if you had to write assembly code for the graphics card, it would kill you. And if you change your graphics card, all you got to do is change the driver, and this dynamic compiler changes, and your application still works. So we need to do that for other types of accelerators, I think. And then the last step of, uh, you know, things that really intrigue me is the static uh, compil compilation aspect. So how do we pick out the parts of the application that we want accelerated? Uh, I talked about that a little bit for you know, tiny acyclic pieces of code, but how do we automatically target a graphics processor? How do we automatically ta target an encryption accelerator or the ASICs in your cell phone? You know, this is a very tricky problem, and I think it's going to be key to making accelerators usable for a wide range of systems. So that's what I've been talking about. Uh, if you walk out of here with one thing you remembered, it's that you know, we have computational demand, we have this low power envelope, and so more and more hardware accelerators are going to become part of your computing systems. Uh, if you walk out of here with only remembering two things, it's that I solved it for acyclic computation. Uh, and then looking to the future, Frankenship is going to be here. So we need to find what the hardware looks like, good abstraction layers, and work on compiler algorithms to, to make using this feasible. And with that, I will open the floor for any more questions. We have to ask for one. <laughs> I'll ask one. Uh, so all of these subgraphs, uh, or maybe they do, uh, do they have memory operations in them, or do they interface with memory somehow? I assumed. So part of the reason that I only was looking at these small subgraphs of computation 
is because the memory problem is solved for you. I'm not considering any you know, memory interface, any specialized uh, techniques. But because of that assumption, you know, these are limited in their value because you know, memory dominated applications aren't going to be helped yeah, at all. Yeah, you showed the graph on that. Yeah. Also. But uh, l let's say that wasn't the restriction. Let's say you, had, uh, you were able to have memory operations. Would that increase the coverage of the subgraphs? Would that Absolutely. actually? Absolutely. Uh, so I mentioned to you earlier this morning that I'm you know, starting to look at larger pieces of computation at the loop level. And you clearly have to support, have support for memory interface when you're doing a loop of uh, computation. So yeah, you do get much bigger coverage because of that. But now the CCA is not nearly as easy to write because it doesn't stand alone, right? Sure. Yeah. Have you, have you looked at that question about how, you, how you'd support memory operations in your whatever CCA stands for? So the, the simple answer is that you can take a, take a page from the embedded systems community. If you look at embedded systems, you know, they hit the power wall so long ago that they've developed all these techniques to, they needed custom hardware. So they've been integrating this for decades. And you know, the simplest way to do that is they just provide a bus interface, you design whatever uh, you know, piece of accelerator you want, and as long as it conforms to that interface, it can talk to the memory through this interface. Right, but in there, I mean, in the embedded world, that's I mean, that's a lot simpler because you sort of have you know, one cycle of memories, and right, the, the, you don't have this very deep memory hierarchy, and and, and you know, you're a lot farther away from memory, and in in the, the device in, in modern CPUs than you are on an embedded CPU. Right? Uh, I mean, they do have a very deep memory hierarchy, and it's very complicated as well. I would, I would argue with you. The uh, they are more cycle, they are cycle-wise closer, but uh, at the same time, the fact that you're so far away from the processor is the real problem. You have to amortize this cost by doing a lot of computation. And the same thing with uh, with an accelerator in a desktop system is that it's all about amortizing the the. The cost we're of these accesses. We're talking about the ones you're talking about in the vault body at the top. Oh, I guess I'm trying to argue that they're the same thing. You know, uh, the Franken ones clearly have to have an interface to the memory subsystem. I guess I'm. Uh, it sounded like owner's question was um, if you wanted to, to broaden just the, the CCA technique, the, the one, the, the, the simple execution unit technique. It seems like I, I don't see the oh, path from oh, there oh. to. I mean. The, you know, there, there, there's this you know, in the Franken technique. You've got a whole other processor, right? That's that's completely custom. And I, I mean, I don't I don't see the path from a, a modified, you know, a, a configurable execution unit in it, you know, in a pipeline, into an ordinary pipeline versus a completely replaced processor. There's a there's a there's a big gap there. I don't I don't see a continuum between those yet. It's just the communication latency. That's the only difference I see. Is that how do you get the the inputs from one to the other? And so moving it onto a bus as opposed to having it integrated into the pipeline, the only question is, you know, how can I amortize the latency of that communication overhead? In my mind, that's the only difference. Mm -hmm. I know I next know nothing about Niagara, but it looks like Niagara one simply sped up RSA, which is just a matter of big num multiplies. That's a now I talked to actually the guys who engineered that and they speed up more than just RSA. It was Niagara too, but, uh, but, the, but, but the big speed up is big num for RSA. Oh, really? I thought they were doing a lot of CRC and things like that in hardware as well. That could be, could be well too. Yeah. No, it's funny. I was talking about this uh, when I was talking to the Niagara guys about this. I was pitching him the idea of this abstraction layer for accelerators, and he's like, that's a really useful problem. I'm surprised anybody in academia is looking at it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>